business, good business, needs to be win, win, win. Welcome to Island Influencers, where we share stories of successful business owners, experienced professionals, entrepreneurs and community leaders based or with influence in the Isle of Man. This podcast is brought to you by Thornton Chartered Financial Planners, because great financial planning has the power to change your life. Now here's your host, Chartered Financial Planner, Sharon Sutton. Welcome to this week's Island Influencers. My guest this week is David Doricott, Managing Director of AFD Software and Mountain View Innovation Centre. And in a first for Island Influencers, uh, you'll note from the recording that we made it outdoors. So apologies for a bit of wind noise, but it was blowing a bit of a hoolie in the north of the island when we recorded this. David grew up in Blackburn with a great love of the outdoors, and in 1976, David read forestry at Bangor University. And during his degree, he discovered an unexpected understanding and interest in computing. This led, after about seven years in forestry and horticultural management, to David in the early 80s, starting a computer business in Scotland called AFD Software Limited. Then in 1997, David moved the business to the Isle of Man. In 2015, David adopted the derelict island film studio site in Lazare. A stunning rural location with views of the famous mountain course, David has pioneered the 25-acre site as a multi-use technology park known as Mountain View Innovation Centre, MVIC for short, one of the most resilient technology parks in the world. MVIC houses a vast community, including a vibrant bistro, multiple small and startup businesses, the most significant event space on the Isle of Man, and even a kindergarten. The MVIC Renewable Energy Project has meant that the site is entirely self-sufficient in using solar energy from April to October each year, during which time it's a net exporter of power to the Manx grid, whilst also the principal charging source for the company's fleet of 14 electric vehicles. David and his team at AFD have flourished a core long-held objective to generate profits and to use them creatively in the relief of suffering, the improvement of society and furtherance of the Christian gospel. The business has been able to, through the nominations of its staff members, to provide millions of pounds, yes, that's millions, in funding for a wide range of relief and development work throughout the world. Here's this week's conversation with David Doricott in episode 56 of Island Influencers. David Doricott, welcome to Island Influencers. And I'm so pleased to meet you, first of all, uh, in this beautiful location outside looking at Sky Hill yes. in the north of the island, Ramsey, uh, near Ramsey, Isle of Man, for this for this particular episode. Thank you so much for agreeing to, to yes, um, you're, you're, be a podcast victim. It's uh, very kind of you. You're very welcome to uh, this uh, northern part of the uh, beautiful Isle of Man where the sun always shines. Yeah, it does. <laughs> and we make lots of power out of it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, perhaps we, we can talk about that. And well, I'm sure we'll get, get to all of that. Just before I press the record button, we were both talking about our relative views of the the Mountain View Centre from, I was at the top of Sky Hill last week on a staycation and you were at the top of Snaefell, were you? Uh, well, you can't see us from the top of Snaefell, but we also walked along the ridge to North Barul and yeah. we, uh, we looked directly at North Barul yeah. and uh, the famous mountain course. Uh, we see the cars just going up and down there. Yeah. Um, uh, and the three legs at the top. Uh, uh, Are you a fan? I'm not sure you were actually allowed to mention <laughs> the three legs at the top. I, well, actually, I just did. I'm, I, I think they're okay. I think yeah. they're brilliant. Yeah. What an effort to do it. I yeah, mean, yeah. You know, you get you get up close to it and you think, what is that? It probably looks enormous when you get to it. It looks yeah. tiny from down here. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Well, David, like I say, welcome to the programme. Perhaps you could, for the benefit of our listeners, tell us all about you, how you've wow. how you've managed to arrive here at Mountain View. Yeah, Houston, well, it, it's, it's a long story. We've been uh, in business now for over 37 years. Um, began, uh, yeah. like a lot of tech companies, in the loft of our uh, two-bed semi in a little village in Scotland called West Kilbride. Right. Um, and for the first 10 odd years, we, we focused on helping people transition from electric typewriters and various other manuals ways of communicating. We were helping people transition into the wonderful world of computers where once desktop computers arrived. And then since the mid-90s, uh, we've been working to help people 
uh, deliver things properly yeah. uh, using the Royal Mail postcode address file. So we are now probably the country's leading specialists in the Royal Mail database that is drives not just uh, the Royal Mail, but all logistics uh, and huge amounts of political accountability. We talk about postcode lotteries, and that isn't just the company that does lotteries or using postcodes, but, uh, but actually uh, accountability right across the British Isles uh, is based on the postcode, that funny combination of letters and numbers that is uh, remarkably the world's best postal system. There are 31 million addresses in the UK, including the Isle of Man and the Channel Islands, and uh, we have the data on every single one of them. And you'd be surprised at uh, where we pop up. <laughs> but almost all the high street brands, and especially in this last uh, 15 months when much more attention has been paid to home delivery. Yeah. Uh, and quite remarkably, our day job, that job has been... Uh, one of the most eco-friendly things we could do because if you think about it imagine a truck full of fresh food and the delivery address is wrong the waste, the time, the fuel uh, and uh, the landfill that comes out of that so uh, when we help people deliver things properly we, we make a massive difference uh, to the way that the British Isles work and that's why our team were uh, amongst the key workers in the UK keeping Britain running uh, and we're very pleased to have been able to do that yeah no, it's it's a fascinating story. So you you started from your house in Kilbride, so in West Kilbride. Yes. Yeah, where were you born? Did, were you, I, you're, I, you're not I, Scottish, are you? No, from, I, I, yeah. I, I've lived my lives in thirds, and the bigger third is now in the Isle of Man. Uh, right. The, the first third I was, was in Lancashire, cotton yep. town, at the end of the cotton industry. My grandparents and my mum uh, were all weavers. Yeah. Um, my mum and dad uh, bought a shop when uh, I was very little, an, an ironmonger shop, and. Uh, uh, so I grew up in, in a shop. Yeah. Uh, and, and you learn a lot about business, serving customers, your numeracy skills. When you're, you know, I'm old enough, I'm giving my age away here, but I'm old enough to remember um, pounds, shillings and pence and having to give change in that yeah, mental you're not, arithmetic. You're, oh, you're not that old. <laughs> yes, I am. I, I can remember decimalization. And, yeah, uh, yeah. So, so you, you learn a lot. And, and as an employer, we find actually that uh, youngsters who've grown up with other influences than education are better set up for life. Yeah. So people who've grown up on a farm, in a shop, with a business or with some organization like uh, uh, a passion like cycling or scouting or guiding yeah. these things actually help young people yeah, and I, yeah. I think uh, educationists recognize that too yeah. uh, that those influences form a, a, a wider and broader and a better approach to, to the to the work yeah and no, absolutely there's um there's all sorts of schemes that kids do at duke of edinburgh and things that, that duke seems of edinburgh the um uh, one world charity challenge yeah. uh, we host that here um but th those youngsters are better set up for for life i think yeah when, when no, that's a good point up. and you mentioned scouting now you had a an influence with scouting well, didn't well, you? Yeah, In, my dad was a scout leader so uh, yeah. I, I i was a scout when i was two <laughs> when I, I, my, my little uh, mock-up scout unit yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, almost all our family life was around the church and the scout group yeah. that was associated with the church. Right. Uh, my my okay. mum eventually became a guide captain as well, so I got a double dose. Uh, oh my goodness. But uh, that, that's what led me into um, uh, studying forestry as my degree. Yeah. Um, and in a way, I've come back to my trees because we, we've planted 4,000 of all sorts of different trees around Mountain View. Uh, yeah. And this year, they've some of them, uh, these trees over here, which uh, you can't see on the audio track, but uh, these poplar trees, which are some of the fastest growing trees that we, we yeah. could get to yeah. kind of ameliorate the rather tin box view of mountain view well i don't know it's, 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 some of them are 25 foot high now yeah, yeah. that's amazing it, and it's quite so a dense version of a silver birch isn't it really uh, this, is, this is a silver birch oh, is it? Here, okay. but the, the trees yeah. that are glistening in the wind yeah. in the further distance are oh, okay. uh, poplar right. hybrids and uh, they're there really to try and break up the exposure of this site because we do get some wind here and uh, and give the other things a chance to get going. But you see yeah. at the lower level, we've got now all sorts of interesting things. And yeah. that mixed woodland is so exciting for wildlife and yeah. for uh, the uh, the environment because edge is really important. So feeding places for for mammals, for birds and things, yeah. that, and, and yet shelter in the trees. So, yeah. The, 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 did, you, did you see the Manx National Farmers Union statistics for the sizes of the relative size of field in the Isle of Man and compare it to yeah. the UK and Australia? It's yeah. something something tremendous. You know, the Isle of Man's got so many hedgerows. So well yeah. done for putting more uh, in. Well, hedgerows, yeah, they're, they're so rich and so diverse. Yeah. And you get much 
much wider ranges of wildlife and um, yeah. plants and flowers and trees all mixed together well. And, yeah. and you, it makes uh, quite a massive difference uh, if you keep your field size and hedgerows. Not, don't grub them out. Uh, keep them there somehow. Yeah. Um, and I think the uh, the old stone walls are quite good as well because there's yeah. loads of habitat in those too. Yeah. I can't see any evidence of a, of a walled garden as well, yet. Well, you're gonna, well, well, well we, actually, if, you're, if you're starting over the there. Here, <laughs> we're just building a little uh, shelter and viewing station. Yes. But the, the right. chap here who's building it for us, he's working today, he's doing it uh, as a, a dry stone construction. Okay. And we've got a, a time delay camera you'll be able to view when it's finished. Oh, fantastic. The, uh, but the workmanship and the skill. Oh, it looks and, amazing uh, from just here. absolutely yeah. amazing to, yeah. to do. And uh, so that will be a place from which you can uh, sit on a windy day and pontificate the beauty of the landscape here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, that's wonderful. So, I mean, you, you mentioned about your forestry degree uh, and I could tell some passion in your voice. I mean, tell me about, about that and, uh, you know, how, what the influence that's had on your life that... Um, you know what, what? What was that? What was that sort of degree like? I mean, it hasn't. It doesn't seem to have really been used in in what you've transitioned into with AFD. So yeah, everyone has this thing when you say forestry. They have this Michael Palin picture of well, I'm a lumberjack and, and I'm an okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> Should we sing? <laughs> yeah, we could, couldn't we? Um, but the forestry degree is is as broad a degree subject in the science faculty that you can get because we have to learn about civil engineering to build roads yeah. we have to learn about all the biological sciences to grow trees and deal with all the, the animals that are in the environment but it's also the the longest term production planning that you you could come across yeah. and as as an accountant uh, you you think well i'm going to put this stick in the ground and in 40 years time yeah. i might get some return from it then if you think about uh, understanding of uh, complex things like compound interest it teaches you a huge amount about that yeah i'm sure but the the thing that drove me into it right at the beginning was not only the love of the outdoors but actually also that of all the materials that are renewable resources, wood is one of the best. Mm. And in the British Isles, we produce less than 10% uh, 10 of our own wood-based products. We import the rest. Gosh, yeah. We don't have the land. The problem is that British no. Isles overall are terribly overpopulated. And if you... If you're growing trees, you're not growing food. And if you're not growing food, you're importing it. So one way or another, you're in an import situation. Yeah. And some of our upland lands, uh, the south of Scotland, the parts of the upper Isle of Man, uh, they're actually quite ideal for growing uh, West Coast USA conifers um, that some of the plant collectors in the Victorian era brought back. We grow them twice as fast in, in the British Isles than they grow over there. Yeah, they don't yeah. look like lovely serried ranks of oak trees. And, and oak trees probably covered the, the tops of a lot of our hills before we introduced grazing animals. But the, the big problem is that they were not productive. No. And uh, with a scarce resource like land, uh, being able to harvest something off it and get a lot of environmental benefits as well if you yeah. do it properly yeah. uh, has been a big win. But as with a lot of primary production, and I think farmers would echo this as well, yeah. uh, our economy is not set up to reward primary producers, uh, whether they be fishermen, farmers, foresters. Uh, the money is in the distribution and the retail. And uh, it's very difficult to to continue to invest in that environment. And, and I'm sure you know lots of people listening to this will kind of say, yeah, that's the problem, yeah. is I produce the milk, but um, that isn't where the money is. No, no. It's, 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 it, well, it, I guess it's a similar sort of situation with um, coronavirus and what that's shown us about where the value lies for the people who protect our lives. And, you know, it's, it, it's, yes. it's, it's the whole capitalism system uh, and, appears and crazy. And compare, <laughs> compare it to the football uh, events, uh, which some, somehow yeah. the rules managed to change enormously for, yeah. even though all you're doing is kicking a bag of wind about on a yeah. field. Now, I'm not belittling the fact that there's huge skill and talent in these things, but, but do society properly value... Uh, uh, things. I think we could have that conversation going for longer than we, we've got for this interview. Yeah, I think we probably could. Yeah. Yes. And um, what I'd really like to do is is just move on to where we got from the forestry degree. Yep. Tell me how how you decided to switch. Yeah. What yeah. happened? What, what what was the big? What was okay. The... Well, well, as part of my degree course, yeah, and it was actually in there. I I ended up choosing a research subject for my final assessment that was very technical, and I, and this is someone who feared maths at A level. <laughs> 
<laughs> but yeah, I actually found, we all? <laughs> found I'd, I'd got such a complicated thing to do, my tutor said, go down to the computing labs and they'll run up a table based on that particular uh, calculation. Yeah. So I went down to the labs and I said, my tutor sent me along. In, instead of giving me a table, they gave me a user number. <laughs> And a password. And, uh, and so I sat in front of this terminal and I asked the guy next to me, how do I get this thing going? But actually, <laughs> after that, I found I understood it. And I right. don't know why. I never did any computer studies at yeah, all. Just intuitive. Um, uh, and and it, it somehow aligned with my brain, the logic. Uh, uh, and I love I loved and still love the logic. I still occasionally manage to get a bit of programming done. Uh, and I find it's Gosh. part of my creativity. So uh, forestry, like as I said, uh, covers the whole spectrum of, of issues, and, and some of its its calculations are complex and uh, yeah. computerized uh, approach. Bearing in mind, we're talking about 1977 when I was doing this stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Uh, a computer was a building. Yeah, I, deep I missed, thought the computer. <laughs> I, I missed punch cards by the skin of my teeth. Yeah, um, right. And uh, uh, and during the next sort of. Uh, launch into my forestry career. I did the tree stuff, but I also did a lot of the complex calculations for my company. I, I was the computing resource for uh, forest valuations in the first company I worked for, even though I was a new boy. Uh, I just joined the company. <laughs> yeah. uh, Hire him. <laughs> and I did it all on a programmable calculator. Gradually, during the next few years of my career, I, I found I was doing more computing and less uh, forestry and horticulture, um, uh, to the point where I was more or less running the computer system for the uh, the company I was on. Yeah. And then uh, Anne and I started the business in our loft, mainly saying using my hobby as a, as an additional income while yeah. our children were very small. But uh, postcodes, I mean, why why postcodes? Well, we we saw an opportunity to help charities do their mailing lists. One client, uh, probably I can say this now because it's a long time ago. One client paid me. Uh, to type up all the yellow pages uh, in order to make him a mailing list of all the surveyors in Glasgow, I think it was. Yeah. But you learn very quickly that it's really difficult to get good quality address data. And then some fast forward a few years later, we come across this postcode database uh, and that, that it has all the addresses in there with the correct spellings, with the right way to get it to the, to the right place. Uh, it by that time, we, with a, a customer base of 60 or 70 uh, charities, are, are all running mailing lists yeah. and struggling to get uh, the right thing on the envelope. That, that's the bridge. Uh, yeah. and, and the point is, you suddenly realize you can do this better than the other people doing the same software. Uh, we're now at 1995. We launch our products at a lower price, easier to integrate with the real software that co com companies and charities are using. Uh, and then a year later, we realized this is where we're going for the next, well, it's now already been 20 odd years. Yeah, gosh. Uh, so it, it's it's just a small change in direction, but has been a, a major benefit. Yeah. Uh, and we've been uh, very fortunate in that we realized right along that because this is a changing target, it makes very good business sense. And many of the customers who first bought from us in 1995 are still customers yeah. and still using and still paying us money every year. So that's very a, nice that's a good too. business model. Yeah, it's great and, business And model. it works both ways. We have a little mantra we use around here that business, good business, needs to be win, win, win. The customer needs to get a good product. We need to get a good profit. And our suppliers need to be properly paid. And if you get all three of those elements in a business, all in a win situation, so many business transactions are win, win, lose or win-lose-lose. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and therein lies disaster. Maybe not today or tomorrow, no. but quick buck type businesses yeah, yeah, are no, not long-term no, success stories. Yeah, it's a, that's, that's a really good way that you've described that. I like yeah. that. It, it so works. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so we have, you know, we train our people, all our people, from finance people through technical support people, through programmers, even through the gardeners. They all uh, ascribe to our make happy customers. Uh, we keep we go to great lengths to keep happy customers because if we keep happy customers, we have twenty years of revenue or more. So the thirds of your life. So you Kil Kilbride. Well, West, West Kilbride. West Kilbride. Well, well, Scotland generally, but West yeah. Kilbride was where we started the business in yes. nineteen eighty. But you grew up in. I grew up in Lancashire. Lancashire. Uh, and, and then and in nineteen ninety seven, several go. things happened. Yeah. First of all. This new business was taking off like mad. We'd had to move house because it was easier to move the family than it was to move the yeah. business. Yeah. Uh, so the business kept, took over the house. And uh, uh, someone came along and offered us a, a rather eye-watering, or it seemed then, an eye-watering amount of money to buy the business offers. And uh, we didn't really have a lot of confidence about uh, how this thing was growing. Uh, 
Uh, and uh, that happened at the same time that the Scottish devolution debate first went through, right. uh, which kind of spooked an English family living yeah, in Scotland. Yeah, yeah, I bet it did. And at the same time, uh, Anne's father uh, had a heart attack, a second heart attack, and, and, uh, uh, and sadly died, uh, and uh, Anne had to leave him. And the short bit of the story is we realised this deal to sell the business wasn't uh, the right deal for us at the time. And... Uh, so we pulled out of it very expensively because we ended up with all the fees uh, on our ticket. But then we still had a business that was growing like Topsy. It had already outgrown the house that we'd vacated. Uh, and uh, we'd also faced some issues around uh, inheritance tax planning and capital gains tax, which were, came to the to our visibility as part of the, yeah, uh, yeah, the due would. diligence to the sale. Mm. Uh, and we settled everybody back down and then went sailing for our family holiday and ended up here on the Isle of Man. <laughs> and I think I can say this now again because time has passed. But, you know, I, I did a hunt, a hunt around, for, talked to a few people while I was here. And there were lots of people winking and nudging me and saying, well, you could get some of the benefits of the Isle of Man's favorable tax situation uh, if you did this and did that. And I, I, Anne and I came to the conclusion the only way to benefit from the Isle of Man's tax yeah. position was to be here. Absolutely. Uh, now, that wasn't a hardship because we love the place yeah. and we've always loved the place the kids love the place we, yeah. in fact we went back to uh, to our boys who were in high school at that time and said we're thinking of moving to the Isle of Man and they were almost packed that night <laughs> <laughs> uh, they completed their education at St Dinian's and uh, they're actually still in the business so yeah. they've grown up like I grew up in the Scouts they grew up in yeah. AFD um, in fact goodness. Philip is uh, younger than the business is they've, they've never not known it Yeah, uh, and uh, they both make a massive contribution because of course they have the whole business history in their uh, memory. That's something else we, we, we really love about our business is that so many of our staff are long-termers. Over mm. half our staff have done over 10 years and we've been giving out 20-year awards for the last five years. Wow, um, that's amazing. Well, it's not only amazing, it's really good for customers yeah, because yeah. customers can ring up and, and talk to the person yeah. they took last year who sold them the system, yeah. who understands their particular need of our product and can talk sense to them. Yeah. Um, so many business businesses are based on employees yeah. who are here today and gone tomorrow. It's mm. a, quite difficult. I, I tease our bank from time to time that I have to keep training new account managers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they keep moving on, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that is, uh, that is quite quite frustrating. Oh, well, bank managers take note. Yeah, so, I mean, this place... How, how did how did Mountain View well, Innovation Centre come about? It, it, it's again an interesting story. We moved, uh, we we did something countercultural and moved our business into Ramsey. We've always been a little bit radical, and yeah, and, uh, well, so it's we, not into Douglas, so you don't have the, like that well, horrendous commute. All all of the all of the above and, and all mm. the congestion and, and what have you. Bear in mind that my commute used to be in my bedroom slippers, having yeah. started the business at home. No, no. So uh, Ramsey was <laughs> quite appealing, and we've moved several times in town uh, as the business grow uh, has grown. Uh, um, and our last move in the town of Ramsey, because technically Mountain View, as you say, is in Wazair, it's mm. not in Ramsey. But our last move was buying the building, uh, Lock House, which um, the uh, people who, gen who developed Mountain View Innovation Centre, or was then Island Film Studios, vacated to move here. In fact, it was perverse because we were in Lock House, but Lock House Animation was at the Island Film Studios. <laughs> anyway, I, I, think, I think we all know that the film industry uh, didn't, uh, or rather peaked, uh, and it peaked just before these this facility was completed. Yeah. yeah. So the the uh, folks who who developed this lost heart uh, and lost interest, moved back to the UK. And when I saw it, uh, we were ready for another move. We needed to expand again. And I came around this place. There were trees six foot tall growing out of the gutters. The, the roads were in a terrible, terrible state. And simply, it had just had not had that that. TLC. And I remember saying to the guy who came around with me, I said, somebody just needs to love this place. It's got a, it's got so much going for it. Oh, yes, it's two big tin boxes. But apart from that, the setting in the landscape. What an amazing the, place. Yeah. Uh, and it's inspiring just coming down the drive, which due south from oh, the yeah. main public road. You yeah. see all the glories. And you think, why would you choose to set up your business and work in the middle of an inner city when we could be in such a wonderful place? Oh, completely uh, get you. <laughs> but, but we also got, a, and we talked earlier about it, the part of our vision for the place was always that this was a wonderful resource for the island and for mm. the community of the north of the island and perhaps would help bring some of the footfall back to the north instead of being city-centred. Yeah. Uh, because with that space and with the facilities that could 
serve in many, many different ways. We've been able to share it. So yep. uh, so uh, the Isle of Man Cycling founded a useful base for doing the 10 mile, uh, is it 10 mile or 10k time? 10 mile time trial, yeah. So, um, for several years now, because there's somewhere to leave the the vans safely while yeah. the uh, the youngsters or the less youngsters go out. Yeah, yeah, they, they go from uh, I think it's age yeah. 14 on the open roads to I think 80 something is the yeah. oldest rider at the moment. Yeah. yeah, but we've also been able to host things like auctions. Uh, we've yeah. had uh, the indoor space has been a, a great refuge for birthday parties in, in yeah. the uh, shall we say unreliable climate that we sometimes have, and uh, and then also to to invest in the in the uh, 25 acres we've got as well uh, so we've got beehives we've got wild flowers we've got uh, open spaces where, where you can just breathe and believe me where, during the uh, the coronavirus lockdowns to have the space to just come out and breathe and walk and be separate but yet feel that there was something that was uplifting and inspiring uh, yeah. as you walk around these, so, uh, these so uh, pathways and, and some of our sculptures yeah it's uh, it's just been a godsend and of course uh, lots of people have begun to discover that as well. And yeah, we, we felt, yeah. felt it's been nice to be able to share it. Sometimes we do it commercially. So uh, I think this coming weekend, we've got a big Isle of Man Expo event, which yeah. is a, a big commercial event. But, you know, the... Uh, some of the ladies who were trying to raise money for the uh, some of the churches, uh, they've lost a lot of money during the coronavirus they shutdown. Have. Yeah, uh, had a had a wonderful day, um, just uh, selling cakes and doing the things, you know, flower arranging and all the other. Yeah, things we had um, we had the Manx Flower Festival at. St John's Mill. Yes. That's like like you, we took our business out of town too for yeah. exactly the same reasons. And uh, yeah, that, that, that has been an horrendous year for lots of charities. So it's lovely to hear you doing that. But anybody who's never been to this place, I mean, I, I grew up in Ramsey, went to Ramsey Grammar School and uh, the views I remember from the art studios were of all these hills here. And yes. The number of times you had to sketch them as a kid, you know. It's, yeah. Coming here every day, we, we look at um, North Barul and Sky Hill particularly, and sometimes they have blankets of, of um, fog coming down, sometimes they have snow, <laughs> sometimes uh, you can't see them at all because no. of the mist. But every, every single one of them is glorious. Uh, yeah. And, you know, we, we have the, uh, the wild geese coming and doing a fly past at dawn and dusk <laughs> each day. I mean, as I said, why would you want to be in no. the middle of Manchester or London? So where's, where's the wallabies? And you've got a green uh, we haven't uh, We yeah. haven't got wallabies yet, uh, but uh, they they're probably on the premises and hiding and looking at us and laughing yeah. from behind the trees. Yeah, probably. Once, once you've got cover, you start to get well <laughs> So um, there's a big renewable project going on here, uh, renewable energy. And I heard somewhere the st statistic, it was Andy Cooper that told me actually, um, the former National Farmers Union General Secretary, he said that the Isle of Man, the Northern Plains, which is where we are, yeah. has the most sunlight per area anywhere in the British Isles. I don't know how. I, I don't know about that statistic, but it feels like we, we ought to be somewhere up there. One of the yeah. one of the areas, and we did do a lot of work before we, we put our investment on the roof. Um, mm. but one of the things we looked at was uh, the fact that we have very clear air and that, that lifts the, uh, the solar penetration. So we don't have city smog, which is great. Uh, yeah. We're breathing good air, but we also, I mean, lets the sunlight through. Um, we we realised we had one of the biggest south facing roofs in the Isle of Man. That there is a general concern that we we ought to try to at least do something about uh, moving away from carbon dependency. And uh, so we we did a test project, but we did it eyes open, and we've we've followed the project uh, throughout open book. So if anyone wants the statistics. Um, we're very happy to share them. You can see uh, in real time how much electricity we're generating now. Yeah. Um, so phase phase one proved. Yes, the I've concept. looked at your website. It yeah. looks amazing. <laughs> phase one proved the concept, uh, and then we did all the less easy roofs that were south facing uh, in phase two. And by that time, the output of the panels had increased. So, although it's a smaller scheme, it's about doubling our capacity. Yeah. Uh, but then you start hitting all sorts of interesting things about uh, grid dependency. And uh, at the moment, as we're sitting here, if the uh, Manx grid goes down, our solar energy is worthless because it needs that phase uh, yeah. link. Yeah. Um, even through our big Tesla battery, which allows us to moderate and to store energy during the day to use overnight, that all goes offline if the grid goes offline. But we've, we've got some clever switch gear. It's more like an... Uh, the control room for the Trident nuclear missile in its interlocking. <laughs> uh, but that will allow us to actually work off the battery uh, and use the grid as a charging source. Um, uh, but the good news is, uh, is when we look at the numbers, they work. We, we 
tested our investment on an eight-year payback on a 20-year generating plan. Right, okay. So the panel should last 20 years. Uh, so far, we've had no maintenance uh, to speak of since the, they went on and we're in year three. Yeah, okay. There's been uh, some big big wins since then too, hasn't And we, we were worried about the wind. We, yeah. we, we did a lot of engineering mm. uh, and structural tests before we, we dared do it because we didn't want to yeah. put £65,000 on our roof and then find it all over bride. Yeah, um, uh, but it, it has not caused any problems. It seems to be fit and forget. It seems to be self-cleaning, yeah. uh, all the concerns yeah. you might have. Uh, yeah, we found the, that with ours. But yeah. the numbers yeah. coming mm. out of it, uh, we've already generated well over £40,000 worth of electricity. That's great. <laughs> I think for us, though, the, the perhaps as exciting, although maybe not as obvious, has been that we're taking a lot of that energy and putting it directly into electric vehicles. So we... Uh, we have little bumper stickers on our cars powered by the sun at Mountain View. Yeah. And at least during the summer period, it's it's yeah. not the case in December, but no. at this time of year, we are, we are absolutely replacing hydrocarbon fuels in 14 uh, daily uh, v- used vehicles. Um, so about a third of our yeah. staff team now drive electric. Yeah. Do you have uh, hot water heated as well? By uh, We don't because we don't use a lot of hot water. Yeah, okay. uh, in fact, we do, but only because we... Uh, we electrically heat uh, we, we're actually exporting energy as we speak right now yeah. we, we'll export um, uh, quite a lot of power back to the max grid which i'm sure they don't want because no, they've got they perfectly good generators yeah, 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 yeah. um, but it, it proves that um, from we think that uh, so far this year our figures would stack up we from april to the end of september we should be uh, energy negative i.e we we create more energy than we use but then during the winter, our big battery allows us to at least take in energy off the grid overnight, which is when it's less useful yeah. to the grid. Yeah. So we're even making a contribution there um, yeah. because the problem with, for the ge- big generators and uh, the MUAs one uh, is that they have a lot of capacity overnight, which they need to either find a use for or it yeah. gets wasted. But I suppose more... Uh, Two phase meters that goes in. People are putting more things on, like dishwashers and washing machines. Later, that's starting, and smart yeah. meters will help yeah. them to do that. But of course, for for us, charging the vehicles is mm. a, is a very good way. Yeah, of, uh, absolutely. Of getting makes... rid of diesel and petrol. And on a thirty mile I- island, I don't understand why electric cars are taking so long to no. take off. No. The, the fear that lots of people have that they're going to run out of power is uh, is just not the practical reality. Um, you can charge uh, one of our Leafs uh, overnight on your domestic 13 amp plug, no special equipment at all, uh, and get a full charge and then drive 150 miles. Well, where are you going to drive 150 miles on a 30 mile by 15 island? It's not It's not going to happen. And no. it doesn't happen in practical no, senses. No, no. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, and I've been driving electric for three years. I thought well, I need to lead on from the front. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so. And it's, that's it's great. great. No, that's that's superb. Well, so if you don't mind me asking, and primarily I, I, I always ask this to guests yep. um, in my day job as a, as a financial planner, um, but what's your earliest memory of, of money, Dave? Well, I think it goes back to my dad's shop um, yeah. and, and giving people change in pound shillings and pence. <laughs> so I think my mum and dad being hardworking uh, Lancashire people. I mean, if you think of Yorkshire people as being thrifty, uh, Lancashire people doubly so. Um, so they, they worked really hard and taught uh, both Paul and I, my, my brother uh, and I, the, the value of hard work. Uh, so much of what we enjoyed as uh, as youngsters was stuff we had to work for so filling shelves in the shop was how we earned our pocket money um, and uh, I think I think that the the harder it is to achieve things perhaps the more we value them hmm. uh, and uh, whilst you wouldn't wish to have sort of child slavery return uh, a little bit of hard work is a, is, a, is an education uh, whether that hard work is in volunteering, in, uh, in in other facets of life, it doesn't necessarily need to be commercial. But in my case, it was. Yeah, uh, it actually reflects something I was. Ha- I was thinking myself today. Actually, it's funny about. I used to have this me- motto called, you know, nothing worth having comes easy. But it actually not. It's nothing worth having comes without effort and trying. I think. Uh, and if you, were, if I was to add one thing on it, is is when you get knocked down, getting up again. That's the yeah. other facet. Yeah. So so uh, you just have to get on with it. Yeah. Uh, Edison and, and his light bulbs. Dyson and his. Uh, well, Dyson's yeah. story is ex- is is inspirational. If you yeah. haven't read his book, read it because yeah. yeah, you know you think this guy's living the life of Riley now as a very rich man, but <laughs> but he put everything into his he vision. Did. 
and uh, and everybody knocked him back all over the place. You only have a Dyson vacuum factory because Hoover made the mistake, or Electrolux made the mistake, of not taking it on his patent. Yeah, uh, crazy. So, of all the things you've done throughout your life so far, then what what would be the what's given you the most fulfilment? Would you say? It's a big question, isn't it? It's a, I mean, you can take it in two parts. If you like, from a business perspective, yeah. but personal as well. You know. Yeah. I think, uh, like any parent, I'm really proud of my sons. They've grown up in a business. They yeah. married. Uh, they've got uh, uh, children, my grandchildren. I, I love them all to bits. It's, it's not that we Lancashire people talk about these things too much. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think in my uh, wider role in the UK, I've, I've been able to bring some uh, external uh, non-exec director roles to some UK charities and help the work of the wider church in the UK. It's very yeah. important to me that people have the opportunity to hear about the Christian faith and yeah. know, I've been able to do some of that. And then this place uh, is, is I mean, at my life stage, it's just wonderful to have been able to almost make this a gift back to the people who work here and the people who visit here and yeah. the people who use these facilities and say, uh, you know, this is just such an amazing place. Uh, let's not waste anything, uh, but yeah. use, it, use it wisely and use it well, but use it. Yeah. Uh, there's nothing worse than a, a resource that isn't used of, of any sort. Uh, a ship in a harbour rots. A house not lived in doesn't do well. And b this this place was just rotting on its feet. Um, so uh, uh, good use. Yeah, well, I, I love what you've done with the place. Can yeah. I say that? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's excellent. Yes, if only we could do something to ameliorate these big green walls. That, uh, <laughs> well, the, you, the trees are playing catch up, but they're they're still taking a while I to get. I think Virginia up. creeper would do well on this uh, side of the we've building. We've got Virginia creeper on one of the buildings <laughs> at the other side, south but, uh, facing, it like so. Yeah, mm. yeah. So, for all any aspiring or, or existing business owners, entrepreneurs, what would be your number one tip, David? I'll, I'll share something that was shared with me after our first year of training. Bearing in mind, this is two bedroom semi uh, part timers. Um, <laughs> How just, many businesses start? Yeah. Uh, I think we made enough profit to buy a, a proper chair rather than just using a stand chair. <laughs> and I was making all sorts of highfalutin uh, uh, comments to my accountant in Glasgow, a guy called uh, Robin Downey, who gave me some of the most wonderful advice. Because uh, I was saying, it's not all about profit, it's you know about integrity and about doing good and all these sort of things. Yeah. And he said, David, do not be afraid of profit. Without, with profit, uh, God can show you uh, what to do. You'll never have a problem with that. And he gave me a few stories of other clients who've done amazing things. But the, the fundamental story is business needs profit. Profit is not evil. Money is not evil. Uh, the, the abuse of money, the love of money might lead to all sorts of horrible things. Uh, but I would say to any business, make sure that you're making a profit. Because without it, you're not a business. <laughs> you might you might be doing some good. You might be a charity. I've, I've challenged a few people I'm mentoring from time to time. I yeah. say, this is all very good, but it's not a business. <laughs> <laughs> oh, fantastic. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good tip. Thank you. It's very important. Okay, I, I've got a feeling I know the answer to this question, but um, and I'm feeling that sales have something to do with it. But how do you relax? Um, how do you keep your life in balance? Uh, I walk these wonderful hills uh, with my uh, lovely wife, Alison. Uh, we we uh, are quite adventurous. You know, we did snay fell from uh, Port Moore the other day uh, and back. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we are both passionate scuba divers. Uh, yeah. I have to say that's warm water scuba divers, uh, not the Irish Sea. <laughs> yeah. uh, right, so, okay. So we've done over uh, 1,100 uh, uh, scuba dives around the world, and okay. that's been fantastic. It's part of our understanding and engagement with God's creation. Right. Uh, and uh, I'm a sailor. Uh, yeah. I have a, a little sailboat, which is what brought me to the Isle of Man in the first place, uh, a different boat. But it I was, was going to say, was not the same boat. <laughs> um, uh, although I've had it for over 20 years. It's is it in Ramsey? It, it, it's, it would usually be, but because of the coronavirus limitations, I have to come out of Douglas all the time. So yeah. it's in Douglas at the moment. Right. Uh, and Alison is a passionate gardener. Now, sailing and gardening are not useful bedfellows. So we, we, when we sail, we, we tend to end up with a four-peak. Uh, that's the cabin at the front for those who are not sailors, uh, full of plants that we've uh, got from gardens all around the west coast of Scotland. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, so we, we know all, the, uh, all those wonderful uh, gardens and nurseries right up the west coast of Scotland. Oh, gosh. Do you? Have you, seen, have you been to the, um, the one that's got the, Andy, the, the Andes rainforest? forest, the one with all the monkey puzzles in? Uh, yes, that's Ben Moore. We were there this oh, summer. Yes. Beautiful it's, place. It's, uh, but I could give you a hundred others yeah. and we could tell you the ones really? that have gone yeah. off the radar because uh, of neglect or because oh, the person with the vision has died and passed on. Yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. So plenty of things. So 
good good life yeah, work I, life balance uh, then yes i think uh, keeping our bodies uh, fit has never been more important than uh, in this environment of uh, concern shall we say yeah, uh, and uh, the the human body is an amazing thing it's in our immune system are dealing with these attacks all the time and i think we've kind of lost that a little bit in our our fear uh, of the last 15 months uh, people who are Healthy normally fight off disease. In fact, I, I understand New Zealand has started to have problems because children's immune systems have not been developing yeah. uh, because of not, lack of exposure to bugs. It's funny when you try to create different balance, isn't it, really? Nature, it is. nature has its way. So tell me what you think are the best things about living in the Isle of Man. Uh, <laughs> I think clean air, um, <laughs> beautiful scenery, space. She says uh, sitting in the middle of the most yeah. gorgeous view of yeah. Space, possible. I think, is, is one of the things. Yeah. We have. I mean, uh, uh, with my dad's scout camps, I visited Guernsey three or four times. Um, oh. Some of the size population, but nowhere to go. Uh, yeah, no, the biggest uh, wide open space yeah. is the airfield, well, well, isn't it? Uh, well, exactly, yes. Yeah. And, you know, we walked up Snaefell and back over the ridge to uh, North Barul the other day. I think mm. we saw about six people. And most of those <laughs> were around Snaefell summit off the tram. <laughs> um, so, so yes, you can you can get away from it. The uh, But the breathtaking scenery, both the seascape and the landscape, and yeah. uh, the, the great gift to us, fresh air. Uh, I think the community spirit in the Isle of Man is both its best but can also be its most challenging aspect there are there's a kind of negativism that sometimes is deleting that but actually there are generous people that we've made our home with yeah um, and uh, very compassionate people uh, and that's beautiful in a consumerist uh, society that you know the western europe and the western world has become yeah so there's there's less of a focus on things here i think it's creeping in but uh, uh, but we yeah, have people are really important and yeah it's good yeah. So, what are, what are our main challenges then? Challenges. Uh, I think uh, our economy will continue to be challenged, particularly as uh, people strong arm the global economic uh, environment. I mean, we've, we're facing the uh, the need to look at our tax situation again uh, because the big boys are, are flexing their muscles. Yeah. Uh, sometimes think that our challenge is to to recognise our ability to be agile. And stop trying to play the big boys game. Uh, and I think that needs to permeate politics. That some of the things we can do differently because we're small and because we can talk to one another, hmm. we, we kind of lose when we try to be like uh, uh, big countries with millions of people in them. I don't know whether are over-exercised about some of the climate change agenda. Um, even, you know, we've invested a lot in renewable energy, but we must be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah. We still need to switch the lights on in December. My solar panels will not be powering your home <laughs> anytime soon uh, in December. Um, no, no mine. And, uh, the, you know, life life is a complex interrelationship. And almost in every aspect of that, we will find that when we hear the simple answer, it's the wrong answer because simple is very rarely the right answer it's the same in uh, international developmental economics you know we are very exercised about fairness for the developing world and we do a lot of uh, uh, work either encouraging uh, people to think uh, internationally but also to give into those situations where we can for more profits but the worst thing you can do to a subsistence uh, agriculture in ethiopia is to just give the guys a load of money uh, because all you do is incentivize them not to grow the crop uh, <laughs> so these things are really much more complicated you know yeah. than than would seem to be and i think climate change is one of them mm. uh, i think uh, developmental economics has gone way off the radar because of coronavirus the uk government have stepped away from they its have. commitments yeah. and i think that shames us and i actually think it's just bad politics because if you if you allow people in the world to be so hopeless that they will risk their children across the the sahara desert in the hands of bandits and put them into a rubber boat with the hope of getting to europe that degree of hopelessness needs addressing for all our sakes. Otherwise, they'll keep doing it. They will. They will. Uh, and they'll fall into the hands of the sex traffickers and the human traffickers and the human slavery. And they'll fall into the hands of the drug pushers because they have nothing to lose. No. We need to give people things, a situation where they have something to lose. And if you have nothing to lose, then what, what, Why would, what's yeah. to stop you going in, into all these traps and yeah. pitfalls? No, no. And so we have to be citizens of the world. I know it's easy on an island to say we should be spending our money at home, and we should, uh, but equally we have to recognise that in world terms we are so 
blessed with resources, with money, with food, with good medicine, good education, or all of these things that would be a pipe dream to someone in Ethiopia yeah. or Uganda yeah. or South Sudan. I mean, there's a country we've oh. worked in and Gosh. You know, they don't even know about no. basic human hygiene, no. or basic, basic education that no. would save yeah. thousands of lives. Yeah, I'm sure. So I know from reading the sort of things that you've done as a as a company, you've you, you've been able to donate millions yeah. to to other causes. I mean, we're proud to say we've you know, but it's it's thousands, not not millions. I mean, how what what sort of projects have you have you funded? Well, to, there's a there's a host of them. So, some are on the radar and some some are not. Uh, yeah. Some we celebrate publicly. Some we do yeah, any that you can. Yeah. But obviously, the, yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. one that we can't say very much about is we've been working with a, an outfit in Yemen, uh, one of the big war torn areas. But I can't tell you anything about it because the people doing it would be in danger. Yeah. Um, South Sudan's a bit like that, where the security of the people actually trying to deliver help and, and education and he basic health. Uh, are in danger themselves every time Gosh. they go to work. Yeah. Uh, in other places, uh, it has been uh, a little bit further on, uh, education projects and personal development for some orphans in Uganda, which yeah. is great delight because some of those youngsters have grown into young adults now with a little bit of help, not a huge amount of help in, in Western terms, uh, and have actually got trades and skills and the ability to earn their own living and to train others. Yeah, and how, so do, you do, how do you do it? Do you, do you get involved with like a... Is it is that uh, scripture it, union and stuff like that? It, or? it varies. Uh, usually, we try to we try to find uh, smaller organisations who have very high pass through of funds. So, I mean, take the uh, Uganda project. There's a lady in our church who personally goes out to Uganda, set up the project, yeah. scrutinises it, knows every knows the individuals, knows the children that we're helping with, set up a primary yeah. school, uh, got good due diligence on the ground and. Uh, and we know that every pound we donate through that charity goes straight to the coalface. Uh, sometimes bigger organisations can achieve things, particularly when they have to work with national authorities. And yeah. uh, uh, so uh, it, it isn't always the best route. So, in for example, in uh, trying to uh, fight against uh, sex trafficking, um, working with agencies who actually have the voice, the, the ear of government and the security forces in the countries where the uh, the criminals are operating is more effective than trying to do it bit by bit. Yeah. You, you, and without putting members of the public at danger. Well, a lot of these guys who take the hat off to them, they're, yeah. they're terrifying. I mean, when you when you threaten the uh, the state of a sex trafficking ring, they they answer you with guns. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Oh, well, okay. Well, thank you very much for this. Is just, <laughs> that, I mean, that's a that's a heck of an answer. Okay, so. Closer to home then, what solutions and opportunities could you see for the Isle of Man? What would you do? I'd go back to that uh, basic agility. I think our, our tourist economy, uh, which used to be the mainstay, I need to, to sort of note my mum and dad had their honeymoon here uh, oh. 66 years ago. Uh, and uh, uh, and that, at that time, they tell me the stories of what the tourist economy was like, and it was the economy of the Isle of yeah. Man. Uh, agriculture and fisheries have been important, but never... Uh, uh, the mainstay of the economy and yeah. unless you go well back to Viking times and things yes. like that. Okay. So, so the tourist economy, uh, providing that we move away from a, a, an over, and this is my view, an over fixation on two motorsport events which are feast and famine to the tourist trade, I think you need to spread it out. Uh, and uh, uh, you probably know I'm involved in the Ramsey Marina project. I do, um, yeah. Uh, and that, uh, to me, uh, obviously came here by, by boat and I've got a bit of a vested interest. But I think that is a more sustainable long-term economy uh, and I think it can attract a lot of uh, good attention to the island, not just yeah. for Ramsey but for the whole island. Oh, I agree. Um, so, so relatively modest investments in some of those projects. I think if we were able to applaud people who are taking entrepreneurial risk uh, instead of putting barriers in front of them, uh, cutting out the bureaucracy. Uh, I don't want to say too much about the Ramsey Marina project, but if I talk about the Ramsey Marina project and bureaucracy as being one of the major barriers for why progress has been slow, then I think I've said it enough. You need political acknowledgement of the fact that the private sector is very good at generating wealth and the, uh, um, the public sector is very good at delivering services uh, if, if it's run efficiently and well. Yeah. Uh, and a recognition of the partnership in that. As a business person, 
uh, I, you know, I think I think I've demonstrated uh, in my working life that we know about generating wealth. And back to Robin's uh, advice, generating profit yes. uh, is is something that businesses do. Mm. And uh, uh, I sometimes freak out some of our employees by saying we should all aspire to paying lots of tax, and meaning we're earning plenty. Yep. Uh, and that can easily be used then in education, in, in healthcare, in uh, services. Mm -hmm. A big challenge for us has got to be that our population, like a lot of the UK, is aging yeah. and becoming more dependent. And I'm afraid that the government's uh, initiative to try to lower the um, average uh, economic the active age of our population has backfired. Paul Crane's work has shown that the demographic has gone the other the opposite way. way. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, with pensions and care, all high ticket items, uh, we have got to get uh, the economic substrate in there. And, and I'm far, you'll understand why, I'm far from a fan of relying on e-gaming as being our uh, uh, saviour, if you'll pardon that expression. Yeah. Um, because that could be turned off uh, easily it, by foreign, yeah. foreign powers. It could, but there's, equally there's a lot of fintech companies around. Fintech, too, as yeah, well, fabulous. So, and, and, yeah, uh, great initiatives there. I, and I suppose one thing that the last 15 months has demonstrated is that many of our wealth-creating businesses do not need to be a geographically... Uh, centred. Um, lots of people have proven they can be very effective. Although I do despair a little bit for people trying to enter the workplace if everybody is remote working. Uh, how do young people get that experience? Oh, yeah. um, but, but that challenge, nevertheless, the barriers to economic activity by 30, 40, 50 miles of open water around an island are much less obvious now they certainly uh, are. for certain types of business yeah. and we should be looking at what those businesses are yeah um, oh, great so david what have you got planned next because i sense you're not done yet by a long shot gosh um, <laughs> <laughs> um I, th I think we've got still some more work to do on our um uh, renewable plant we, we're busy trying to work out how to come off grid uh, mm -hmm. there's some other interesting generating um, technologies that are actually ip'd on the isle of man that we'd like to prototype and show fantastic um uh in terms of that december mm. question that i was just talking yeah yeah about. so it, yeah. it's on our radar uh, we, we'd like to continue to help this place to flourish and be of service to the community it's starting to grow out of uh, the big knockback of coronavirus and everybody being frightened to leave their front rooms yeah uh, so that we have lot many more people coming out here many more events um uh and uh i uh, i guess that there's still a lot of recovery work to be done i think there's a huge mental health challenge amongst workforces amongst the community generally yeah uh because there's been such a fear diet in the last 15 months we we desperately need to heal that yeah uh and uh, and one way of healing it is by demonstrating that life is actually worth living is flourishing is full that there are aspirational and inspirational things and places to do and go to. But I don't have a big project. At the moment. <laughs> not, not today. <laughs> That's not Ask enough. Ask me tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, all right. <laughs> so, um, books. You got any books that you want to uh, recommend to our listeners as a good cool. source of uh, inspiration or well, just a good read? Yeah. I'm going to, this may sound a bit sort of quirky, but I, I think loads of people have Bibles on their shelf gathering dust. Yeah. This is the living word of God inspired, I believe, and Christians believe, uh, from God himself. And with it's not a manual for life, but the wisdom, the insight uh, of a God who loves the creation he's made, which is part of what we're expressing here, um, is hidden in these dust gathering books. So I'm going to I'm going to be brave and I'm going to say, take it off, dust it out, okay. read John's gospel. <laughs> which version? <laughs> oh, I. Uh, I love the New International Version, but there's a lot of modern translations. Yeah, if you yeah. want the poetry of ancient English, just as you might go back to Shakespeare, then by all means go back to the King James Version. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not mocking it, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. But if you want something that speaks to you in your current contemporary environment, the New International or New Living Translations would be good books to pull on yeah. yourself. Okay. Um, actually, sometimes interesting to read familiar passages in other versions, because sometimes there's a different light. 
Um, and if you're really, if you're really getting uh, very geeky about it, go back to the Greek or the uh, uh, Hebrew, and uh, and because sometimes the cultural context of some stories that are very familiar to has only come to light yeah. in the agroeconomy of a nomadic people or uh, uh, the you know the people in the Middle East. Uh, yeah, you know, we have to remember that Jesus was probably dark skinned with brown eyes, absolutely, not, not with the blue uh, uh, stuff no, that everybody no, puts no, into no. his, uh, think, his think Western there. architecture. Yeah, yes. yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you. And and do you have a favourite quote? Something by which you live, or many? <laughs> I'm going to go back to Shakespeare, and I'm not sure I can quote it all, uh, uh, but it, it refers to sailing, and uh, it, it, uh, I think it comes from Julius Caesar. Is There is a time in the affairs of men which, taken up the flood, leads on to fortune. And it goes on to talk about what happens if you don't, you end up in the shallows and misery. Um, <laughs> I, and I think particularly in a time when we've faced fear all around, having people who are opportunity takers, uh, it's something Britain's been particularly good at uh, over the centuries. And one of the reasons I think it, it's part of our culture and, and perhaps quite different to Asian culture is we take risks, we take uh, opportunities, call them whatever you like. We are entrepreneurial. We see ways of going. And whether that is, you know, William Hillary establishing the Lifeboat Institution uh, here on the Isle of Man, or uh, us developing a computer business and, and helping people to deliver things properly, um, those entrepreneurial opportunities can lead on to the good of society. Um, and the Victorians were particularly good at it. They mm. were much more courageous in their designs, in their go-getting. I mean, they probably did a lot of stuff badly as well. <laughs> but you look around the, the island, we celebrate many icons of Victorian opportunity-taking. We do. Uh, and uh, wonderful. <gasps> Albert Tower was looking at it. Right yes, there. I always laugh about the Albert Tower because <laughs> it commemorates the fact that Queen Victoria never actually landed on the <laughs> <laughs> Royal Ramsey, I always found it really amusing. Albert did, though. Albert did, yes, but, but it's a sort of m monument to the yeah. fact Queen Victoria never came to Ramsey, yeah. and uh, she was the poorer for it, I'm sure. I'm sure she was. Oh, well, that's lovely. Okay, well, so um, so people can go to learn more about the U and AFD from the website, I presume. Yes, we, yeah. uh, if they want to know more about our software enterprises, afd.co.uk, yep. and if they want to know more about Mountain View and the beauty here and the rolling display of wonderful photographs that my staff team gather every morning <laughs> and post on there, mvic.im. Yeah, uh, and oh, that's lovely. Well, come and look at the place. We're open uh, during working hours. Come and drive around and see the view that we're looking at right now. Yeah. Enjoy the walks, enjoy the trees. Yeah, um, and of course the event this weekend coming up the... The uh, Lifestyle uh, Expo, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I think so. Yes. Yeah, uh, it sounds so. Home and Lifestyle Expo. Yeah, all about gardens. Uh, I heard I that bit. Yeah, I think it's more about construction, oh, homes and gardens. Landscaping. Yes, uh -huh. yes. There'll be quite a lot of that sort of stuff yeah, going on. Yeah, sounds great. And, uh, <laughs> But yeah, we're, we're, you know, working week where the place is open and uh, we welcome people. We, we've tried to maintain a culture around our workplace, which is not fearful. You know, lots of yeah. businesses have mm -hmm. got uh, passes to get in and out. And all. This is not, not an announcement to all the thieves around the world. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but so long as we're able to, we try to share the property in an open yeah. uh, and uh, I love man type of way. We mm. don't have to be uh, living in the fear uh, no. that a lot of the inner cities have become. No. Yeah. Oh, that's, and, and that's super. Everything. Well, it's been lovely talking to you yeah, today, great. David. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to this episode of Island Influencers from Thornton Chartered Financial Planners. To find out more and for useful links, visit thorntonfs.com slash podcasts.